Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted again to be able to speak to Richard Stavely of Rockwood Strategic, one of the UK's finest uh, small cap investors. So uh, welcome, Richard. Very good to see you, Paul. Yeah, well, um, we've obviously got a bit of a, uh, a rock and roll type uh, market at the moment. Uh, we've had, got the cost of living crisis, tightening central banks and um, a sort of like nosebleed inflation level. So, so putting all that together, what's your sort of like view for equities going forward, particularly in your sort of like, you know, your small, your sweet spot of small caps? Um, well, I think, I think whenever I'm asked that question, I always think of the great JP Morgan's answer, uh, answer to the, the same question. He just said that they will fluctuate. Um, the, the, truth, the truth of it is, is the longer the time horizon that you want me to answer about, the more likely I'm going to be accurate, which is basically invest in equities over the long term. We all get very rich. What's happening in the short term, though, um, is much more difficult to, uh, to, to, get, to get right. I think um, that... What is important for listeners to, to understand is that your average manager, particularly in small cap, will have 50, 60, 70. There are ones with over, over 100 stocks in their portfolio. And the truth of it is, is the more diversified you are, uh, the more likely you are to match roughly what the market's doing. But if you're concentrated, which Rockwood is, you end up being uh, the performance being far more driven by the idiosyncratic and stock specific um, um, outcomes for the, for the portfolio. So we do think actually that we might be able to navigate these markets a bit easier than others that have a much more diversified uh, diversified approach. Um, I think that um, the key factors we look at to determine the outlook um, are monetary policy, as you say. That's the overriding um, uh, factor. And monetary policy, we're just only just getting going with quantitative tight tightening rather than QE. Interest rates have obviously started rising and I'm afraid are going to continue to, to rise further. And whilst that remains the case, we can't get too constructively bullish about the outlook for um, for equities. Credit conditions on top of that are relevant. Uh, the banks are in good shape, but credit conditions are starting starting to tighten. I mean, I, I never got stuck into the whole crypto um, uh, <laughs> markets, but if you think about how much wealth has been destroyed from peak to uh, to now in terms of those, it's, I think it's a couple of trillion. Uh, you, that, that's an interesting thing uh, to, to note. Equally, e economic output um, is slowing, but remains um, you know, possibly on trend and we're probably likely to move into a recession. Um, corporate profitability has been as high as it's ever been. Margins have been never higher in, in America. So all these things mean that we are probably going into a bit of a, a, a decline phase. Trying to not be wishful thinking, though, but constru constructive. Uh, within small cap, there are going to be you know, a, a number of small companies that um, completely uh, perform un nothing like uh, what's going on in markets. And we've, we're, we're, we're aware of those, uh, Crest Check being one of the, your, your yeah, favourites well, online uh, uh, this year. But UK market as a whole uh, went into this phase already very cheap relative to global equities and has in the large cap space, a lot of the sectors that are much better positioned, like the defensive names in the FTSE, the banks, resort resources. Um, um, and we also slightly, uh, well, we are underweight in low, dura uh, low duration, uh, um, you know, you know, long duration equities, uh, uh, growth stocks, uh, which have been really, really in favour. So I think we think value investing is starting to come back. We think there'll be a more balanced backdrop for stock selection um, over the next over the next few years, which again plays to uh, what we the way we go go about select, selecting stocks. Um, it's it's not e it's not easy, um, and I would encourage again your listeners to think about what happened in previous bear markets. I was researching the uh, 1929-32 bear market. Um, and there were at least four occasions where markets rallied um, over 20% during that phase of which, in aggregate, the market fell 70-80%. I don't think it we're looking at that, but just that should be um, no, um, noted. And equally, in the 2000 to 2002 bear market, which has got a lot more um, characteristics in common with the current market um, dynamic, that had three bear market rallies of 19, 21 and 21 um, percent. So just we just got to be quite careful about um, entry prices when things feel like it's all it's all sort of earning. The key is to keep a, a sense on monetary policy. As I said, 
And what's related to that is how inflation. So if inflation looks like they've got core inflation under control when we exit out the temporary factors, uh, they should be able to um, stop, you know, put on the brakes on, on interest rates. If it looks like it's getting sticky, wage demands, you know, remain very high, it's becoming inflationary expectations uh, become dominant at a, a higher level. I think we're in for quite a tricky ride. The average recession in the UK going back to um, 1956 uh, is, is uh, interestingly, uh, about eight and a half months. But uh, all of them either were six months long or 15 months long. So, um, and the last two were 15 month typers. So I think that, um, I think we've, you know, we've probably got a, a, a difficult phase ahead. Yeah, certainly the Bank of England are expecting a sort of a recession. And, and uh, yeah, if, if you look at sort of like these bear market rallies, then it could be a bit of another um, another head fake. But um, looking at the sort of like the, the Rockwood strategic returns, you're actually up this year. So given the S&P's down 15%, big pat on the back to you guys. Uh, and can you just talk about sort of the, the focused level, you know, this fo focused portfolio construction? Because most sort of like... Um, you know, fund managers certainly in the small scale pace have they, they they sort of manage their um, their returns and their portfolios with a di very diversified and therefore you have a mean reversion as you say to the actual indices. But you guys only have sort of like you know ten to fifteen stocks, and you've got can you talk sort of that sort of concentration and the focus you you put on them. Yeah, so we, we split the portfolio into two parts, what we call our core holdings, and we want to have about five to ten of those. Currently, we've got eight. Uh, that make up the majority of the portfolio. We're a bit actually more concentrated than normal at the moment, but we're uh, and we're running at about 75% in those uh, eight, eight of the portfolio in those eight holdings. And then the rest of the portfolio will be is a mix of smaller ones, which I like to call springboard holdings, um, which are essentially ones that where we have the potential to become a big holding, or they might just be they have all the characteristics we're looking for in a stock, which is uh, a um, very cheap valuation where essentially value value investors, and then a recovery turnaround opportunity linked to either strategic management or operation or, or operational change, and those. Those uh, sometimes you can't come in with a massive position straight away. You need to get to know the company, you need to get to um, engage with the business as a shareholder before you can uh, um, um, increase that stake. Our largest holding currently is Crestcheck, which is actually as, uh, uh, as a result of performance, 25% of the, of the portfolio. Uh, the good news for investors and or anyone that doesn't know us that's just thinking, cry. Christ, you know, quickly, that really is a lot. Uh, the last holding that went through 25% was um, our wonderful Orgean, uh, which uh, we made uh, eight times our money on for shareholders and then eventually got taken over from that large position, monetized into cash, and then we've been, uh, you know, reinvesting risk, reinvesting that in other, in our, in other holdings. The concentration risk, um, the way we mitigate the risk that are around that is threefold. Having a few holdings means you can just spend so much more time on them after you've bought them, but also you can spend a lot of time due diligence to them. You're not meeting hundreds of companies all the time. You're basically focused and doing additional work. So our due diligence levels are higher than, than, than your average fund manager has the time, time to do. Um, and secondly, because we're concentrated, we tend we take uh, much bigger uh, stakes than, you're at, than most fund, fund managers. Um, so at least 5%, which would allow us to call an EGM if we really got very upset about the, the outcomes. We haven't had to do that uh, so, so far, but often quite a lot more, sort of 10, 15% of the company, which allows us a real voice uh, at, um, with, with the business. And in fact, in, in those core holdings, we've got board positions on a number now and or have influenced the membership of the, those boards so that we've got people we know are really good at focusing on shareholder value and doing doing the right thing so that's how that's how we mitigate that risk mm. so you so say you're, you're obviously a very active stock picker but you do seem to be where necessary and correct me if I'm wrong here, an activist investor. So where you basically think this needs to be sort of like, you know, management change or, or strategic sort of change, maybe, maybe even realising some, some, you know, realising shareholder value. It, it, it would, have, would have I correct in thinking that's what you, you end up doing if you need to as well, the activism side as well as the active stock picking side? I think 
activist does raise the hackles for a range of people and it's a sort of it's it's not a particularly british notion as such sort of causing chaos and shouting around and issuing public letters and you know um, <laughs> turning up at um telled our paper and uh complaining about the 50 board positions and all the rest of it the the the, the truth is is we see it as a sort of a highly engaged strategy. We, in almost all the situations, it's a very um, positive and constructive relationship with the board mm. and, and management. When everyone thinks activism, the first thing they think of is someone shouting like, Jeff's got to go, he's useless. Um, but actually, Jeff often actually just needs a bit of help with realizing that the division he bought such as Tasman at Crestcheck, yeah. he bought broadly at the wrong time and it's actually not a very good business anymore. It's losing money for shareholders and maybe it just needs to, it, you know, the decision that they need a bit more of, a, of, of encouragement to say the right thing to do is to sell off the division, focus the business. And that's all you need just to get the share, to get the re-rating um, started. Um, often with, um, and it's just nudging on operational uh, aspects that we see from other companies we invest in, how, they, how things can uh, improve. So it's a mix of strategic and operational change. And then if you, just on the management piece, it's, it's you know, you can be not an activist and then on look at a, a company that's not an activist. Regularly, the board and the management are evolving all the time. So you, you it's, it, it, there's often an opportunity to say, or oh, someone's, you know, maybe, you know, it's time to sort of evolve or or, refre or, or refresh, um, but we do we do get stuck in. So with Crestjack, for instance, um, you know we encouraged the appointment of uh, Stephen Yap onto the board there, who's an operational person that we know, uh, a CEO of other businesses, and uh, really understands how to run manufacturing businesses. And then also Nick Mills uh, from Harwood has gone onto the board um, uh, uh, as well. I'm actually now on the board of uh, of Cent Centaur Media. Um, and I'm also on the board of Bon uh, on Bon Hill and uh, Flowtech Fluid Power, one of our other large holdings. Um, well, you uh, again, you, you may, may know that Roger McDowell, uh, mm. who was on the board at uh, Orgean, uh, became yeah. chairman last year, uh, and also which you may have noticed is that um, Jamie Brook, um, a, a well known investor in small cap micro cap, has uh, joined the board recently. He, Jamie's actually on the investment advisory group that I've set up at, at Harwood to help me um, make sure I'm being uh, doing the right kind of due diligence and forming the right conclusions on our new investments. So we've got five people have gone on. Um, they I um, speak to them about any of the significant investments I'm going to make and their views and insights. And you've interviewed Christopher Mills with his nearly 50 years of investment experience. He's on that advisory group. Jamie's on that advisory group. Um, there is Adam Parker, who was one of the founders of Majedi Asset Management over 30 years of experience. And, and some other members I won't go through all, all now, but um, I, I think it's, yeah, that's one of the other um, characteristics of this, of this approach. Yeah. Well, he's certainly sort of uh, knocking the ball out of the park. And let's just move on to sort of like the one stock that obviously you mentioned is the is the largest largest position, which has become the largest position simply because your the returns are really good. Is is Crestchick, which does sort of like uh, niche specialised uh, load banks that help sort of commission and test backup power supplies. That obviously is uh, is really at front and centre with the energy crisis and the move to uh, all things sort of renewable and grid stability uh, and also sort of data centers. Can you just talk us through sort of how you see that business sort of progressing on longer term and obviously, you know, what what yeah. the opportunity so it's in, is? It's in strategic, yeah, so it's strategically in a very good position. Now, I mentioned they had a uh, division that was had been loss making for a number of years, exp overexposed to the oil industry, which is under a lot of a, a lot of change, um, and we've now stopped stopped the losses on on that and focused on the uh, on the load, on the load bank business. But you sold before, it, haven't you? It's sold. Yeah, we have. <laughs> we sold it. We got a few million for it. I was absolutely <laughs> delighted. Um, yeah, which was great. So um, you know. Crestcheck itself, the balance sheet, you know, bullet, you know, brilliant position now. Very slow, you know, small amount uh, of net cash, two or three million of net uh, of net cash. Uh, great for going into any form of recession anyway, or needing money to invest invest in the business. And um, and I think um, it's obviously performed very well. We're the IRR. We are on a twenty six percent IRR now um, um, through Peter Harris, still executive, still executive chair. 
and the business um, bedding down the new capacity that it pulled on with the new factory early this year, which I went and visited and um, um, and and was really noticeable. And this is really relevant um, how much it's changed in the last 15 months or so that that business they actually he, he hasn't had as much publicity as he should but they uh, alongside the, the management changes a new COO was appointed a, a crest check whose former Rolls Royce and he's really injected you know I would say a new level of professionalism um, and uh, efficiency into the manufacturing o o um, operations there you could really just tell it on the shop on the on the shop floor um, they are full and the, the, the order book is in record shape. And in fact, I think the last update they announced, you know, record the big contract ever. Um, they um, and what, what's driving part of that is um, so organic growth is going to be strong from here and continue to be strong. The you, you'll be aware or some you may not be aware that they, they, these load banks are used to make sure your, your temporary power, uh, one of the your temporary power is working. And so hospitals use them for their backup generators because you don't want, you know, middle of middle mm. of all of this, you know, the, 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 the machines to go out because there's been a been a power power cut. But that's always been a good business for them. But they're also now really into these data centers where companies like Google and Amazon are clients. And it's sort of the demand for data center growth is just uh, fr frighteningly huge. And we all know, we know exactly why. The head of, the head of sales at Crestcheck made, made the, 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 the comment to me, he said, Richard, you know, we're doing, we're doing well, we're in, we're in um, hospitals and um, the hospitals are going great and the data centers are fantastic. You know, one's a matter of life and death and the, and the, and the other is the hospitals uh, because the data centers are absolutely, um, have to have 99.9999 yeah. and are very, very uh, demanding. They're obviously an international business already and expanding of, and have got a huge expansion potential into into the United States and with some of these international international clients. Um, margins are already strong, but should remain remain robust. So they've got scope to invest in the fleet and grow organically through their existing client client relationships. I should say at this stage that you know we we have over about twenty five percent of the company. Um, it's still um, relatively small in the grand and grand scheme of things, um, and um, you know, I'm sure now it's been cleaned up um, that the um, trade buyers and other kinds of buyers will be um, having, you know, taking a good look at this at this business um, in terms of whether it would help or support their own ambitions in uh, equipment hire or um, other kinds of power uh, mm. hire around the country. So we'll watch. It's it's nice to see it uh, perform well. It's easier after a run with a stock like this to think, oh, I should take a few profits. I'm sure some people may even be tempted to. But what's what characterizes this company this year is the scale of the upgrades are absolutely you know huge and. Um, I, you know, I think you've said on another call, I think your expectations are 11, 12 million issues sort of EBITDA, you know, it's that sort of ballpark is where, yeah. where we're going with that. That actually means that Crestcheck's now only on, only on kind of six and a half, 6.89 times, you know, EV mm -hmm. EBITDA, you know, with no leverage. And we should also mention that obviously they own um, all their free, it's all freehold property. We've actually sent Harwood uh, property consultants up there to um, talk to the to the business a, a, about that. Um, but that's another sort of hidden asset that's uh, that's that supports supports the group. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it looks as though it's got a, certainly a very positive uh, runway. And uh, yeah, I mean, my, I'm expecting sort of like 12 million of EBITDA for at least 2023. Um, now, I, I just well, one question I do have on, on the sort of the business, et cetera. I mean, obviously, you've done really, really well, um, you know, in seeing this opportunity very early and investing it and helping all the changes and stuff like that. With the energy crisis, I mean, you see it already in California. We've got rolling blackouts, and that's largely because of the impression unprecedented heat wave that you people are on air cons and therefore the local grids are, are forcing people to to basically go to blackout and to uh, and therefore you need a more back, uh, back backup power supplies and therefore testing for load banks but equally you've got this potential thing in in europe and the u but maybe even the uk but certainly in europe if uh, the energy crisis deepens over the winter you're going to get um, rationing of power and potential blackouts across europe what's that going to do you know to 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 crestchick and likewise 
you know, is this a good hedge in terms of other portfolio that if we do get a, we talked about a really tough recession, perhaps induced because of the Ukraine Russia crisis, this one could still do could do really well. I I completely I completely agree, and we that's sort of that's our expectation. The thing that's happened here is it's basically it's a great. It's like there's been a structural change to their end markets. And no one's really realized. Um, well, people are realizing, but it's a small business. Uh, but and that what that difference is is that we've all been for many years just you know taken for granted that power is fine and we've got loads of energy. And now there are some um, businesses and institutes like the hospitals that just have to absolutely make sure. So they've had temporary power. Crestcheck also used to serve um, the oil and gas markets and still, still does to an extent, but um, it was far more dominated by oil and gas markets, where again, you're in remote locations, you need kind of temporary power, the temporary power needs, you know, so that's, that would be, uh, needs testing. So that would be their, their end market. But I wouldn't think of it as this winter. I would, and, and, and that's a long-term shareholders or people that might want to own this business long-term will be thinking energy, it's 20, it's 2050. It's, are we going to be able to really make sure with all, all the change, are we going to be able to go to full green through and transition over the next 30 to 40 years in the level with the level of power liability that a range of other companies and businesses have never thought we need a temporary power solution just in case. So new people are saying we need temporary power and um, that all needs testing. So, yeah. so it's, it, it, you know, as well, uh, unless, unless you sort of think we're going to sort of seamlessly move to 100% renewables and um, then um, we're, 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 we're going to be okay. <laughs> mm. Well, I think that certainly there's been a, uh, you've been waving your magic wand certainly over uh, Crestic. Mm. Now, just moving to a couple of sort of newer positions um, you've got is our uh, Gentech, which I think is a sort of like a B2B type of uh, 4x e-payments um, business that um, serves sort of like institutions, hedge funds and high net worth individuals when they invest in, uh, well, basically they need, they need foreign exchange, et cetera. And the business seems to be flying uh, and, the, and the valuation is really low. I mean, I looked at the last one and it's about 12 times PR uh, price earnings ratio. And I, and I think it's got 38 million of cash on the balance sheet compared to a market cap of less than 100. So the, the what am I missing? Well, the cash number is a bit lower than that. So uh, right. cash is more like 25. So they've got some regulatory cap. It's sort of trash. Uh, yeah, okay. Trash, but they have a bit less, but they still have lots of actually cash and free cash that they can use to, to grow the business. It's it's a really interesting phase. It's simple. Um, basically, corporates are, are being very poorly served by people like Barclays and HSBC. So you've got a slightly more complicated FX solution than you know what you need to buy your paella and your beers from to go on holiday in Spain. <laughs> so don't think, oh, I can do my FX really easy here. So in between that, and there is there and and you know having a long relationship and sort of hedging four hundred thousand things to sort of uh, GM or G you know a GE or whatever. Um, there are loads of small businesses that have really important FX requirements, and frankly, they're just getting really annoyed trying to call people like Bob Barclay. It's about to be taken seriously. So not just our Gentex, but there are a few others that are trying to take share and um, from the big from the big from the big banks. Uh, our Gentex are up to 1,600 clients, corporate clients now, ma mainly dominated in the, by the UK, but they've opened, they're just recently opening in the Netherlands and Australia. Um, and they um, they offer a personal call. You know, you actually get to speak to someone who understands them, and they'll do their FX requirements. Fantastically capital light. I mean, I don't really want to say Wolf of Wall Street stuff, but I'm one of the rare, one of the few people that have actually been to the offices, and it's full of very vibrant young uh, people who are trained exceptionally well by Argentex to get on the phones and ring people and find new corporates, and then they hand them over to more senior people, and it's a quite very dynamic. But that is not a capital intensive business model. As a result, the rookies are fantastic, like very high, uh, very high rookies, well at late late twenty percent. Now, what's what sort of given the opportunity? Well, guess what? Everyone got overexcited and they were allowed to IPO with just, you know, far too ambitious. It was already growing really nicely, but they went for sort of very high margin expectations and high growth expectations. And their only own goal was they were probably not investing quite enough in their technology yeah. that, they, that, they sh that they should they should have been. Um, since then, they've now appointed as a new head of tech, very impressive and very uh, well regarded within the within the in industry 
and they've they've mitigated. So my operating margins are more like going to be like 18, 19, 20 percent for now. Uh, but they can they should be they should move to 30 percent plus margins over the next two to three years relatively easily with on, with ongoing growth. Now, what's the exciting point? You mentioned the valuation. Yeah, that's nuts. I tell you what's properly nuts, Paul, is mm. that. There is a brilliant business that lots of small cap managers own um, um, that is uh, 780 million market cap. Yeah, okay. uh, that, that's obviously small, um, which is uh, Alpha FX. Uh, people love it. They manage their expectations really well, which is what our Gentex needs to start doing a lot better. And believe you me, they, they, know, they, they know that now. Um, but because of managing those expectations, well, Alpha FX has roughly, just rather than bombard you with too many numbers. Alfredo has roughly double the number of employees as Argentex. Mm. It has roughly double the amount of sales of Argentex. And it has more than, the, it's got higher margins because it's got a bit more scale, but those are the margins Argentex remain. It's got a bit more than half, half the profitability. Argentex, um, though is clearly, as it was implying, is on literally six times sales, whereas yeah. Argentex is on one and a half. And they yeah. basically are the same business, but just one's half, half the other. So we see that as a, a low risk, low downside opportunity for a re-rating and, uh, of that business um, via the new investment in tech and just ongoing growth. And do they actually sort of totally neutralize in terms of hedging their, their, um, their, their FX book? In terms of because I know, you, you know, they don't actually have any long or exposure at all on their. Yeah, they don't take any. They don't take any principal positions, but they are posting margin on behalf of clients. So they need to be careful about um, uh, credit risk on, on on counterparty risk. Although typically it doesn't last for very long. It's literally at that mo it's just at that moment and sort of hed hedged out. So this isn't one where we, you know, we um, we're we're not expecting to come in and go. The yen's collapsed. 30%, you know, huge problems at Argentex. They're, think, think of them as a service provider. They're not taking, you know, principal positions or trading or anything like that, anything like that. Yeah, well, it does seem as though the uh, the valuation will mean revert at some point in time compared to with Alpha FX on six times and uh, six mm -hmm. times sales and Argentix, as you say, is about one and a half times. Now, moving to the other end of the sort of the tech spectrum, we've got uh, Titan, which is a, a pretty small business, actually. I think it's a sort of like a, a 10 million market cap, does sort of like doors and windows, very traditional um, and obviously, it's obviously exposed to the, uh, the house building sector and construction. And I imagine it's probably struggling a bit with the sort of the inflation because all the building sector is as well. Do you want to talk us through why you've sort of like gone through? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very small business and I'm, I'm almost surprised you can buy a, a big chunk of the stock. Yeah, um, I'll answer that piece in a moment. Now, just first in regarding how we get the stock with the stock position, the liquidity of it. But what I would say, first of all, is that um, Titan, um, um, it, it actually came, even like, despite being so small, it came, came up on one of our screens, uh, our bespoke screens we have for identifying undervalued uh, situations and recovery opportunities. They, um, they are exposed uh, to housing. Um, and I would very much, a bit like Northbridge as it, as it was, when we talk about stocks like Titan today in September um, 2022, I tell you, it wasn't a very nice story to talk about Northbridge five or six years ago. And fund managers like talking about stocks where everything's perfect and brilliant. So Titan is at the starting point of our investment yeah. where everything's really quite horrible, both the end markets and the business. And what happened? What, what we identified was that they they lost their. They, they, it was it's a fam, founder. It was a founder run and founded business in 1970. Uh, and he has basically, he's now life president, but role uh, hasn't been involved in day to day for quite some time and had a management team around him who had been with him for many years as part of that team. And they've sort of evolved out of the business. The company made a, made a um, was unlucky a bit. It appointed a new CEO who then left relatively quickly uh, because he got another job offer and didn't and didn't stay. So they were sort of left with sort of not really kind of operational management for probably for, for too for too long. They've now got uh, a new CEO, uh, Alexandra, uh, who uh, is ex uh, Johnson Mathy uh, and very experienced and you know very uh, you know professional ma manager. And she has identified, which is very clear, is is there is huge scope for evolution or an improvement or both just how they run the factory 
um, which is you know, just the way when things have been run by a founder for many, many years, it's just, you know, you can just think about how the how much refreshment could be done. Product strategy, sales strategy, the actual strategy. Now, <laughs> um, no, and so all this needs to be done. There's a new CFA, new CEO, got two new NEDs have just gone gone on gone on to the, onto the board. Um, what's but what's the downside stroke versus the upside? So what wide have flagged up was it seemed to be quite asset rich. And we found almost it's like a Buffett. It's a, it's a Ben Graham stock, which, which right. whenever you read that chapter, you just go, well, there are never any stocks valued like this anymore. So I just could, could not believe my eyes. Was it? So, yeah, you said 10 million market cap, just slightly under that, actually, as we speak. They've got about three million of cash on the balance sheet. They also you have to ask them about this and it is there in the kind of accounts, but they don't really is that they own, uh, they have a Korean subsidiary uh, where they also have, where there's, has its own factory. There's a little bit of inter inter, but it's mainly its own factory. That subsidiary they own 49% of, so they don't consolidate it. That, they, that business has also got 3 million of cash in it. Uh, so that's essentially yeah. another one and a half of cash to us. Uh, the last accounting point, um, they had, uh, Titan had 5 million of stock. Now it's got too much stock and partly that's to do with the supply chain issues and things like that, but a lot, a lot of stock. So you're sort of five plus one and a half plus three, right? And then uh, what you've got is the property. So they own the freehold of the site in Haverhill. And just you go you go on Google, Google Earth or whatever. I've been, it, you know, it's significant. Uh, they have it in the books for about 3 million quid. We've um, introduced um, hardware property consultants to them. We think that's um, very, very um, conservative. Um, conservative. Um, and what have you got? You've got a business that has been making kind of single digit margins, sort of mid single digit margins ish. Eight was sort of best uh, on about 18 to 20 million of sales. Um, those will not, they'll probably make a, they'll probably be loss making this year. So the, 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 the plan for, for this investment is, is to, uh, as it's doing is to everything gets refreshed. We then get a new strategy, which will come out over the next six to nine months. Everything will be cleaned up. The IT system, they've got brand new IT. They, the, the tech was terrible. No information on what they're selling, uh, you, you know, not enough stock information available to management, all that sort of stuff. That's all coming, that's all coming, coming into place now. And in three to five years time, we should have a business that's making, we think they should be shooting for 10% margins uh, with growth. Um, we're not sure Korea fits into the, um, into the, um, the median and they've got plenty of opportunity in the UK. You mentioned the housing and doors and things like that. Just where are the, where's what's really, in, what's hidden in there is, is that they have 40% UK market share in the thing called a trickle vent. It's that thing that you yeah I know, I know tops of their tops of their windows. That in June of this year, that became a mandatory on any new window to have a trickle vent. So right. this is kind of regulatory right. drivers, and um, so the demand for that piece of the business, which should be picking up to mitigate probably um, weaker in, um, um, and soft, softer trading generally with with how housing uh, and construction. But they also have been developing uh, the um, more mechanical ventilation units, heat transferring units, those sorts of things that uh, a company called Volution is yes. uh, one of the UK yes. market leaders in. And um, they this looks like a it's it's kind of what the sort of thing that Volution do. So we know that's a, a very good business, high returns, we know what kind of profitability that can, that can make. So a, a range of things that we think could support this being an asymmetric stock investment, mm. which is uh, now on the stakes. We were managed to find a, sta uh, uh, find a stake, and um, so we bought uh, eight and a half percent of the company, uh, but only quite a small position. So we're sort of less than two. It's one of those opportunity positions. You know, we may choose to once we get to know them a bit more, we might go to much higher of the company. Um, you know, it, um, if the, once we get really comfortable about it and we know things are going in the right in the right direction. Right. OK. Well, I mean, another one you've um, you've talked to me about, I know sort of like about 18 months ago, we were very positive that you own um, a big chunk is, is Bonhill, which is a sort of like a another one, which is pretty small things. It's sort of 
uh, sub 10 million market cap, in fact, sub less than uh, 11, 7 million market cap, which is which is sort of like did well at one stage and then has sort of fallen back. And uh, I think it does sort of like uh, financial services, sort of like uh, B2B advertising website sort of stuff for, um, for to help sort of like fund managers, asset managers link in with um, IFAs. But um, do, do, you're going to talk through that one because all you know, information systems on the on the B two B side. I think. I mean, Bond Hill is even smaller than Titan. I mean, people yes, exactly. Like this is sort of nano cap, basically. Yeah. Um, bon Bond Hill has some great, great uh, brands. It's um, it that focus on financial services. It actually sells to um, sixteen of the top twenty asset managers in the world. Right. Um, it's brands being a portfolio advisor. They have investment news in the state, which has been around for many, many years, and is very, you know, very well, very well regarded. Um, and a number of other, t- and a number of other titles. It has had a strategy under the under the previous CEO who changed this this year um, of uh, buying buying and building and buying more and more titles to try and, to try and get big. That hadn't really been working out uh, for a couple of reasons. It's, it appears they probably overpaid for one of the uh, uh, for one of the acquisitions in the uh, in the states. Uh, integration was not fantastic, uh, not fantastic. And then it's it, it, externally uh, the COVID environment was uh, very has been very difficult for them. What's transpired is they've also basically made the wrong decision about um, the tech platform the business should use. Um, that's now about to uh, to change. Uh, it's just been flagged in the most recent uh, inter- interim results. And technology is just is so much more important now for B2B media in terms of what you can sell, mm. how you can speak to your clients, how you can monetize their interest and know everything they're interested in. Because they do have uh, you know, a lot of eyeballs uh, uh, looking at their, at their products. It, um, it has, we, we think the business should be able to make about 2 million of EBITDA. It'll, um, and, and, there is no reason why it shouldn't be able to do that next year if they if they execute if they execute well. It had um, as a result of thinking it was going to become a lot bigger. The sort of central costs were a bit elevated to support that, and they also had some smaller brands, very small brands that um, were being diluted would be diluted in time so, um, and weren't really being addressed. They we just got those sold. Um, it was announced just recently, again, for a bit of money. Um, it, the headline wasn't very much, actually, just under a million pounds, but six million market cap, a good cash to come in to support the, support the business. More importantly, though, it allows us allows the management team to uh, take a load of costs out of Central and make the business just far more um, focused, mm. simpler, less bureaucratic. So now they've basically got a UK stroke Asia international business run out of London. And then there is a U.S. division focused on North America. Both of they, they, they're both well, um, you know, de- decent brands. Still quite eventy, more than subscription. There, that may change. That's the potential to change as well. But really, but but good events. They also have a uh, really good uh, property that they'll be upset. I haven't mentioned actually. If they're listening. Is that um, called ESG Clarity, um, which they launched um, quite early in the ESG um, um, kind of trend. And which covers for four asset managers ESG type type issues, and uh, that that's been growing very very strongly as you you might imagine, and it's clearly got good audience share within that within within that space. So business has got net cash, it should be able to make two million of EBITDA. We've got just under twenty percent of the company. Uh, I'm a non-executive director. Um, the new CEO is a media guy. So the former CEO was a very good um, broker and uh, co- a corporate broker, um, but not from a media background. There's an, a new CEO who's a media guy. We think that's going to be a uh, slight change of emphasis and good for good um, good for the business as well. So, um, so let's okay, let's talk. I know, I know, I yeah, know okay. You're okay, I'll spill the beans. So yeah, so we you know we think it's easily worth 15p. It's just right. absolutely right. nuts. It's absolutely nuts at five and a half, six p for this business. And if we chose to, you know, if 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 there was in, in this, if there was industry interest in it from the much bigger groups, yeah, they they they're not going to be able to steal this from uh, shareholders um, um, at the wrong at the wrong price. And um, so um, it, let's get it let's get it fully cleaned up, deliver some profitability, and see see what happens. 
you know, it seems to be sort of like a major trait actually with the uh, the Rockwood strategic is the sort of the advertising sort of expertise of the laying, but also sort of significantly undervalued and and helping the management team. Now, another one which is in that sort of space is um, or significantly undervalued is Centaur Media, who's run by um, Swag Mukherjee, and I think he's very much a sort of a similar similar sort of outlook to you as in terms of you know, making sure the business is uh, really singing because he's been working, I think, on a sort of margin acceleration plan, uh, which should should come to fruition sometime next year. And the margins, the EBITDA margins have been improving, but also the top level growth. And do you want to talk us through this one? Because it seems to have quite a good recurring revenue streams in sort of like uh, all things sort of like B2B marketing services, advisory, and um, obviously the uh, legal side with the lawyer. Sure, sure. So Centaur, I have to say from a Rockwood perspective, this feels like our brilliant um, Olympic and Commonwealth uh, relay teams, because if, if, if Orgean was doing the first, you know, uh, first length and sort of handed it now on to Kreszczek, he's mightily coming around the bend. The sort of the next that I'm, I'm anticipating that Centaur is our next large position to really start m- motoring. Um, um, Long and short, we think there's at least 100% up, upside. We think the market is fundamentally undervaluing this. There is absolutely no reason that it should be capitalised at, at, the, at the current level, which is 68 million quid, by the way. Um, for, your, for, your, for your ludicrous 68 million pounds, you get nearly 15 million of cash, um, which takes you down to your EV, you know, uh, you can work it out for, yourself, for yourselves. And then in that, and then what do you get for the, for the business? Well, as you say, he's been doing a fantastic job sorting out the last two divisions. And this is very much a company that's been on a huge history. I first came across Centaur in 2001, um, when it was uh, 100, basically 100% print. And they mm. were going, oh, there's this thing called the internet. Maybe we need to do something about this. They were really slow about doing something about it to their to their uh, detriment. And we're talking a few management teams uh, uh, ago. Those that At one point, it had to have eight verticals, and it got down to the last two. And then Swag's been doing a brilliant job um, sorting it out. So as you said, they're up to about 18% margins, but the management action plans to get them to 23 next year. The acutely named MAP 23, 23% margins in 23. And they still, they're, still, they're still confident that that's achievable, at which point you've got a fantastically profitable business. Um, which um, is being valued as if it isn't a fantastically pro- pro- uh, profitable business. I think, you know, the look for EV to sales is like 1.2 times. Uh, typically, you'd expect well over two times for that, kind of, for, for, that kind of, for that kind of business. What are the two divisions left, though? They, um, they have no, real, no synergies between the two. There's no argument about that. One's, one's uh, the lawyer with unbelievable property that if you know any lawyers, and um, we all do um, uh, one way or another, uh, they all take the lawyer. And currently subscriptions are running at 113%. That's a subscription business I like. You know, you know, you may you may have a second thought about Netflix when they're forcing adverts down your front and you, you sort of like Disney Plus now, but uh, the lawyer, if you're a lawyer, you take the lawyer. So that's a great property. It's highly profitable. Um, Quite niche, quite small, can continue to grow, but um, is um, a great, little, great little business. The divisional director there is is fantastic, um, um, and they, their lawyer awards, for instance, are you know the event to go to go to in the in the industry. The other business, um, which is I've always said strangely named Exium, X E I M, it stands for Excellence in Marketing, but I. Mm. Sure, we could have come up with a better name, to be honest. To be honest, to be honest with you, but the the is is it's got a mix of marketing uh, properties w- w- within that. Now, it's it's well known for owning Marketing Week, the big the big rag in the marketing industry, um, and also Festival of Mar- Marketing, which is a huge conference. It's coming up actually this month, where lo- everyone goes. You get all the CMOs go and a lot, but a lot of activity, multi day uh, uh, event. But their core brand is actually called e-consultancy, which is it's, it's a sort of mix of consultancy and training of businesses to digitalize and maximize their own marketing departments. So they have clients uh, that are blue chip FTSE, name, FTSE names where they help them go on the journey and max, do really well it, to help them improve their digital. And that's very profitable uh, and, and highly regarded business. They also have an influence of business in there as well, where they, uh, again, they sort of connect up people like Unilever or SAB Miller with 
the right influencers in the right geographies uh, or at a glo globally um, to help them there. That um, and that business again has been um, is profitable and, in, and improving. Finally, which we absolutely love, is they've got this business called Mini MBA, um, which is a MBA in marketing, fully accredited, mm -hmm. which has got real um, uh, legs to it. In, in as much as the the growth trajectory is fantastic, I think it was growing at sixteen percent the last no, mm -hmm. no no numbers, the top line. It's highly profitable. A lot of it's online. It's kind of like e, -le e, -e learning. We think that's worth a lot. Um, um, you know, significant multiples of of its EBITDA, which could get to four. And, you know, during the next 12 months or so, um, um, something like that's what we'd like to see them be doing. If it's not next year, but it's definitely that kind of trajectory. So that business alone, if it was on a double digit EBITDA multiple, which is what the sort of thing private companies would pay for, could justify you know, almost all the market cap alone. And it's just one piece of the of the marketing business. So, um yeah, I, I'm convinced the, th the third leg will be Centaur. And, will um, be Centaur. And the downside again. And, and this is, you know, we come back to where we started this conversation. And Centaur is just classic, you know, recession. Yeah, it'll have a, it'll have a soft effect. Will they still uh, a softening effect in some elements of their business? No print now at all. Literally le less than half a percent in print. All subscriptions to the lawyer and things like that. Um, you know, it, it should be able to continue to improve its margins anyway. The downside is protected from its balance from its balance sheet, and the management team are you know on on great shape. So and it's very undervalued. So that's that's how we mitigate people's concerns over the the outlook. Good. Okay. Now we're moving on to the final one on advertising. Just say a quick few words. You've got a bit of a holding in um, MNC Sarchi, which I know is undergoing a bit of a bid at the moment. It's sort of like. Uh, it's got two parties after it. I think next fifteen, which is always a nice position if you're uh, a shareholder. Next fifteen and uh, Vin Murray as um, um, acquisition vehicle. I think um, ADT. Yeah, um, it's just so frustrating, Paul. I mean, I can't tell you how annoyed I am. Um, I mean, we are we're currently Rockwood's looking at a thirty nine percent IRR at the current share price from our in price. Um, classic conditions for us. It was very undervalued. Change was underfoot. The founders were moving out. New management team taking over. They thought March they can get margins up to eighteen percent in their in their in their view. At that time, they were kind of uh, sing, single digit, and it was coming off an accounting scandal and a load of, and a load of, a load of mess. We identified that that was the case, and that's why we got uh, in, invested. Um, Vin um, had had interaction with the company um, and then kept, went onto the board uh, through, took a PA uh, personal position. And then she managed to um, um, launch, I mean, you're very kind calling it the AVT, ADV, the, the vehicle. Uh, you know, in my, in my mind, it was one of the only SPACs that we met, that managed to get away in the UK. I, if anyone will remember what that, those were. And, you know, yeah. Uh, we add them in with crypto and uh, NFTs and all the rest of it that was uh, before, before the monetary policy <laughs> moved into a new era. Anyway, he, she quite rightly raised money because she's got a fantastic history of, of, of both managing businesses and investing both her own and other people's capital. So, um, and she could see in MCC Sarchi, the opportunity with MC Sarchi, and that, and so she's gone all in with her SPAC and with her own own money to try and take take. The the, the slight problem is, Paul, is that she's bidding a ludicrously low uh, price <laughs> for it, uh, and she knows it. I'm we all know it, and the way it's structured because of her her approach, it's 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 it, you, existing shareholders would get diluted quite a lot uh, to bring her on board uh, through the through. The, the, the deal structure and um we don't need to be diluted at this at this level um you know we the company has actually the, they it's got over it's got nearly 40 million of cash it was 36 7 8 million of uh, of cash at the moment there's no uh, burning need to raise money and do uh, and do deals particularly when the shares are so uh, so under undervalued you know the com company can't be clearer they've reiterated literally only the other week that they're going to make over 30 million of profits this year um and their and their plan is to make 40 million of profits next year and we're looking at a company market cap at 195 million 
uh, with the 40 million of cash. So, you know, the EV EBITDA is about three, three, three and a half, three and a half times. And this is just, a, it, you know, it's a fantastic brand. And it's just the stock market had a lot of faith in it because the pre, the fact the founders had got a bit long in the tooth. There was an account scandal, looked like the financial uh, controls had gone a bit um, haywire. And um, so, you know, the, the market hasn't looking at what, what you've got is, you know, one of the best advertising you know, agencies in the world. Those that are concerned about ads um, should um, you know, look no further than, you know, the actual accounts of uh, Isachi, which explain how a lot of their um, um, advice that they give. It's not just it's not just Don Draper stuff. It's it's. Um, it's uh, advising governments and people like the World Health Organization, the Olympics, uh, governments. They worked on the Biden campaign more recently uh, for them. They, you know, they don't have a political cue. They do a range of campaigns. The Australian government. They also do a huge amount in sports and entertainment, which to a great you know, is pretty resilient, I suspect, in terms of spending there alongside their traditional clients, which um, go from everyone from TikTok to uh, make mcdonald's and um so i i vin quite rightly has uh a support from some shareholders she's working uh history at delivering value for shareholders and and, and delivering on businesses and for getting her involved in, in in the business um that said you know giving it away on the cheap and diluting uh you know i just think it's not you know, we, we won't be accepting that that offer e equally next Fifteen, uh, very well run business. Um, Gaming shows change my age now, uh, but I, I first invested in Next Fifteen uh, in about two thousand and five, four. Uh, Thirty million pound company, and on a P of ten. Um, mm. I mean, <laughs> you know, these things, it's quite interesting how they come. It's very well run business. Would be a good, a good partner, but again, and they're. They're just they're just nicking our recovery st story off as far too far too far too early. So I would back the existing uh, management uh, and boards to drive a re-rating of the business in in normal markets rather than accept these bids now. Um, you know, but if they want to pay a much much higher price, we'd we look at we'd look at that. Oh, brilliant! Uh, thanks very much, uh, Richard. We, we, I think the connections, unfortunately, sort of like um, sort of breaking up a bit. So we'll we will, we'll we'll sort of go through some of the invest the. Uh, the other investments uh, in, a, in another um, sort of like uh, conversation, the inv infrastructure. So uh, in, in terms of sort of like if investors want to, um, to put some money into uh, to Rockwood Strategic, how best to do it? Is it best to contact you or to, uh, to, contact, to go straight on the website or buy, just buy the yeah, stock well online? Yeah, we've got a we've got a brand new website which has got loads of information about how we go about things, philosophy, process. It's got all the reports we have quarterly. Uh, fact, fact sheets uh, but the easiest way thing to do is literally use your dealing account rockwood's trading today rkw is the ticker i'm trading at a discount to uh, nav um there'll be a new nav oh well, it's depending on when this broadcast goes out there's a weekly mm. nav comes out on, mon on monday mornings and um it's fair to say you know we are super excited about this portfolio you kindly mentioned that we're up year to date now you know we, we seek to um we you know to to, to move move that on over the next uh, next few few years, frankly. <laughs> so, um, but we are stewards of capital. One thing we didn't mention, which is worth your listeners knowing, is that personally myself and Christopher Mills, who I mentioned is in the investment advisory group, we have personally bought twenty nine point nine percent of the shares in Rockwood. We are one hundred percent aligned with um, anyone that does become a shareholder it's just inefficient as we've seen and heard this you know, hopefully during this 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 chat uh, um, part of the small cap market which is uh, just has so many opportunities for dedicated professional uh, investors brilliant okay well thanks very much uh, Richard and congrats on the uh, on the returns both short and long term and uh, very much look forward to uh, touching base going forward so thank you thank you very much Paul